Oh, yes, Mina. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. I see a bunch of familiar names out there. Uh, so today's webcast is going to be about uh, subnetting and two techniques that you can use uh, to figure out exactly how to build your subnets. Uh, the, I have actually 27 slides out here, and it seems like a lot. It seems like we'll never get through it, but a bunch of them are, are sort of background. So we'll get through those uh, pretty quick, I think, and then we'll get to the meat of the presentation, which is the, the two techniques. Now, excuse me, I'm, uh, I'm also podcasting the chapters from these books, and so if you just can't get enough of uh, networking, if you're like me, then you can get those out at iTunes. There's a couple out there. Okay, uh, so without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. Everybody. There we are. Okay, uh, maybe the best way to start is to talk about exactly what a network is. Everybody always talks about a network and says, oh, we're all connected to the same network together. Uh, and so it's just a bunch of computers connected together. Uh, but really when you get down to the actual networking components, it's really uh, computers that share the same address range or that are on the same IP-based network. Now that has a couple of meanings. Uh, that also means that computers on the same network typically share a default gateway or router. They will also have the same uh, broadcast address for their network. And it turns out there are a pair of broadcast addresses. There's one called a limited broadcast and another one called a directed broadcast address. We'll, we'll touch on these a little bit later on. But in addition, um, we can also push broadcasts down to layer two frames. So there's a special MAC address, all Fs, in the destination, which is a broadcast frame. And broadcast frames also exist on the network. That is, they don't pass the router. So when you get right down to it, there are a bunch of details when you say we're on the same network. Now we couldn't really talk about subnetting if we didn't really understand what a mask was. So let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, you've all seen IP addresses and you've all pulled them up uh, for your hosts. And so we use a network mask for a very specific purpose. Uh, the network mask is there to help us determine what network we're on. Now, the, one of the things that um, we often get trapped in also is that we think about networking as a router sort of thing. But it turns out that hosts, your computer, Macintosh, a Windows-based machine, Linux, it doesn't really matter, they also use uh, network masks because they also have their own routing table built in. Uh, and you can actually see this uh, uh, pretty easily, uh, especially on, um, on your Windows and Linux machines. Uh, and for those of you running uh, Happy OS X or OS X, you can see uh, your routing tables there too. So the mask is really, really important to us uh, for forwarding traffic. Now the example on this slide that I have here is for what we call a Class C network, and I'll just I'll touch on those a little bit later on. Uh, but this is also what we call the normal or natural net mask for this particular network. Uh, if they're default masks. They can, be, um, they can be easily identified because they have lots of 255s in them and lots and lots of zeros. The trouble with the normal or natural masks, as we'll see here in a minute, is that there just isn't a whole lot of flexibility to them. Uh, oh, I see we've got a question up here that, uh, about links to podcasts. Uh, you can get those off my website or you can just search for me um, out on iTunes. All right, so here are the classes of address that we typically use for addressing. Now I want to just stress here for a moment, this is talking about class full networking, and class full networking is not the model that we currently operate under, but it's where we got our start from. So here we can see that we have class A, B, and C, uh, and then there's the network uh, ranges uh, in the second column there, and that's really the first octet or the first byte of the IP address and base 10 numbers. The third column is the normal or natural mask for this particular class of network. Now each class of network has, or, um, each address class has a certain number of networks and a certain number of possible hosts on each network. And as we can see here, class A networks, well there just aren't very many of them. 
Um, but for each one, there's a tremendous number of hosts. And as you work your way down to class C's, you can see that there are actually a large number of class C networks, and on each class C network, there are only 256 possible addresses. Now, one thing that I'll point out here is that um, the addresses that you see here um, are, the, are the, the basis for our, our networks. But obviously, if you know about private addressing or zero config, um, we see that there are a lot of addresses that are actually pulled out of this available address space. Okay, so classes vary in size and the number of hosts on each particular network, uh, and, we each, and each class has its own natural mask. Uh, RIT here has a class B network, so we would fall in the second uh, category there, and our address actually begins with 129 here. Uh, but again, this is really, really inflexible and not very efficient in terms of addressing. And the easy example that we have here is if you have a small, um, small network or a small business that you wish to start, you have 10 computers, the only way to manage that under this system is to give you to, uh, an entire class C network. So you have 10 addresses that you actually need, you get 256, and, and so we, it's a lot of waste. Okay, uh, somebody quite correctly pointed out that 127 is reserved. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, too. That's actually the loopback address. Now, this slide here is uh, the logical AND. Uh, two representations of it. Here's an AND gate. And the reason that this slide is here is because this is the actual logical operation that we use uh, with a mask. So when you have an IP address and you have a mask and you're trying to use the mask, to determine what network a particular host is sitting on or what network you're routing to, uh, the logical process that you go through is an AND gate. And so the way that you read this is that we've got an address bit that might be from the network and then the mask bit from the subnet mask. You AND those two together and then you get the result. Now on the bottom there in the red and the yellow is what we call the truth table. And, and the rule is that anything ANDed with a zero results in a zero. So if you can see the address bit and the mask bit there, if you AND a zero with a zero, you get a zero, a zero with a one, you get a zero, a one with a zero, you get a zero, and of course, uh, that leaves us a one with a one. And that's the only case in the logical AND uh, that gives you a resulting one from the logical process. All right, now if you're a little confused so far, don't panic. I'm gonna work through an example for you. So um, let's take a host, and this is the example right out of the chapter, so if you don't get the, this webcast or you, 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 know, you lose your notes or something like that, this is right out of the chapter, so you can get it from there as well. So the, the base 10 numbers for this IP address, or what we call the dotted quad notation, is up there, 200.150.100.95. So the first thing that I've done to figure out what network we're on is that I've converted this IP address to binary, and we can see that here in the first line of red. And I hope that this particular color that I've selected isn't too brutal on your eyes. I tried to tone it down a little bit. Now this is a class C network, so what I've also done is taken the natural mask here, 255, 255, 255, 0, and conver converted that to binary. Um, so the next step is to perform the ANDing operation, and that's where you start on the right side and you just take that first one and the zero there and you AND them together. From the truth table we know that this gives us a zero. So working from left to right, I'm sorry, from right to left, what we're gonna do is just go bitwise uh, one step at a time and AND all of these uh, pairs together. And the resulting uh, numbers are there in step three where we have uh, all zeros in the fourth octet. Converting this back to base 10 numbers, we get that the network for this particular host is 200.150.100.0, okay? And that's the basic process that you follow, and it doesn't really matter what your IP address is or what your mask actually is or whether you're doing supernetting or subnetting, it always works the same way. Okay. So if you know me, you know that IP packets, and well, packets of any kind are near and dear to my heart, as is subnetting. But here's the rub, right? So IP packets do not include the network masks. 
So all of the processing for the masks and, and the networks is done on the hosts and on the routers. So you install IP addresses and masks on, on these devices. Now the tricky part is that you never actually know the mask for the destination. You might know the IP address, you might know the name, and even the port that you're connecting to, but you don't know the MAC addresses or the masks for the destination. Now this also means that there's actually a lot of assumptions that go on, and it's easy to screw things up uh, when you're messing around with masks. So that's a really important detail to remember. Okay, so let's go back to this mask idea uh, one more time. So here's our, our natural masks for the different classes. Now the next thing that I want to introduce is that if we convert these guys to binary, so in that example, the class A, that 255 is eight ones, right? One, 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 one. Now wherever you have a one, that's actually the network portion for that particular IP address. And the zeros indicate the host portion. So again, you can see that in the class A, you actually have eight bits of addressing for networks and 24 bits of addressing for the hosts. All right? And this goes down through to class C where you have 24 bits of addressing for the networks and eight bits of addressing for the hosts. And this is why we have so many possible class C networks, but each class C network only has 256 possible addresses on it. Okay? Now that's a really important idea uh, to, uh, to stick with us as we move along here. Okay, now this is from an earlier chapter in the book when I'm going over IP addresses, and hopefully that, I hope that you can read the slide okay here. Now if we keep the idea from the previous slide where the ones indicate the network portion and the zeros indicate the host portion, another way to say that is that the ones constitute the binary prefix. The prefix is the network portion. And the zeros constitute the binary suffix or the host portion. So these are some of the reserved IP addresses that, we're, um, that we have with every network. So anytime you have all zeros in the binary prefix and all zeros in the binary suffix, the base 10 example there, 0, 0, 0, 0, is um, a special address reserved for DHCP or what we call bootstrap. Okay, um, when you have an IP address in the network portion but all zeros in the host portion, and the example here is 129.21.0.0, that is the address for that particular network. Now, if you take the same network address and you, instead of having zeros in the host portion, you put ones in there, then you get what we call the directed broadcast at that particular network. And the example here is 129, 21, 255, 255. Okay? Uh, now, let's take one step farther and we put all ones everywhere, right? All ones in the prefix and all ones in the suffix. Then we have what we call the limited broadcast. And this is a broadcast at this particular network. It's one of those broadcasts that's usually married with a broadcast frame at layer two and doesn't leave this particular network. And as one of our uh, listeners pointed out earlier, 127 and anything is another reserved address and that's loopback. Now for those of you that are really jazzed about um, seeing what your computer's doing, if you're on a Windows machine and you um, just go to a command shell and type route space print, um, then you can see your, um, your host routing table. All right. Now, in our example, the 200.150.100.0 network, again, all zeros in the host portion, if we put all ones in the, in the host portion, we would get 200.150.100.255, and that would be the directed broadcast at this particular network. Now, if you were to go through the subnet or the, the network mask and you were to and those, uh, all the possible addresses together, you would discover that all of the addresses from 0 to 255 would be on the same network. And that the usable addresses on that particular network, that is the ones we could actually sign to hosts, would be 1 to 254. Now we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in a minute, but this is the distinction between possible addresses 
and usable addresses on a network. You cannot assign the network address or the broadcast address to a host, or at least you shouldn't. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about subnetting. What is a subnet? Well, it turns out that a subnet behaves in the exact same fashion as a network, but if we get into definitions here, from RFC 917, uh, it's logically visible subsections. And we accomplish this by manipulating the network mask. That's the whole idea here. So um, if you're going to do subnetting, you have to figure out how to manipulate or how to change that network mask and understand that what happens when you do that. Now again, subnets behave in the exact same fashion as the network. The only difference is that the network is class full and subnets are not. So it has a network or subnetwork address. It has a directed broadcast at that particular subnet. And all hosts on, this, on the subnet will typically use the same router to get off the subnet. All right, so how do we actually manage this? Well, subnets are created by stealing bits from the host portion of the network. Okay? And the way that we do that is by manipulating the subnet mask or the net mask. All right? Now that portion that we've stolen, I like to refer to as the subnet portion of the mask. And we'll see exactly what I mean in a minute here as we look over the binary. All right. So before we go any further, um, one of the questions that was uh, given to me early on here was, okay, so you create subnets, but what is the point? Why bother with this? I mean, it's hard. You have to figure out binary. It's a pain. Why do we need to worry about this? Well, uh, if you have a whole bunch of nodes together on one network, as the number of nodes grows, well, they start to generate a lot of traffic, as nodes are wont to do. Now, significantly, a lot of this traffic is broadcast. So we'll just take the example of ARP for a second. Let's say that you have a, a network of 200 nodes out there, and they're all talking together on the same network. Well, that means that each host is ARPing for 199 other addresses. And the funny thing about ARP is that, or Address Resolution Protocol, is that we store that information in an ARP table now, for those of you who are not real familiar with networking, ARP is there so that we can discover a MAC address that goes with a particular IP address. And we store that information in a table. And that would be fine, except that the tables time out after a couple of minutes, and we have to do the whole thing all over again. Now, this doesn't even count other protocols, such as uh, Windows uh, registration and uh, all of the services associated with Windows, DHCP, other overhead such as SNMP and routing protocols and things like that. So just from the perspective of the growth of network traffic, it's a good idea to start chopping large networks up into smaller areas or subsections. But in addition to the traffic problem, it's also possible that the users might have different security concerns. So, for example, uh, when I was in industry, we had a lot of different departments. Uh, and you, so you had the, the folks that were in the office, you know, uh, the uh, secretaries and, and executive assistants and all the folks that ran um, the office, they would be in a particular network together. And then you had the engineering folks in another network um, themselves. Now, if the engineering folks are working on new designs, templates, things like that, then they have a desire for a certain level of security. And so their uh, security concerns might be significantly different from the office folks, which might be different from uh, the maintenance folks, things like that. So there can be varying differences of, for security. Another uh, reason to uh, split up the network a little bit is quality of service. Now, probably one of the best examples of this is voice over IP. It's quite possible that all of the users on your network might have the same quality of service concerns or needs. But the minute you stick voice over IP on the network, well, all of a sudden you have traffic that should get priority of some kind. And so it's not uncommon to see voice over IP in its own VLAN in it, and therefore its own network or subnetwork and given quality of service um, uh, preference over some of the other traffic. Now, down at the bottom there, I've got a rule of thumb there, 130, and that simply means that 
a rule of thumb to start with is that it's okay, you can get away with usually about 100 nodes per network or per subnet, um, or 30 really busy nodes. So <clears throat> that is to say, if you've got a, a bunch of nodes and they're not really doing very much, uh, they're not really heavy, heavy duty traffic generators, then you can sometimes get away with putting a bunch of them on a subnet together. But as you start to create servers or folks that are streaming a lot of media, things like that, that number starts to drop a little bit. Okay, looks like we're okay on questions so far, so we'll just keep going. All right, so back to our subnet behavior. Uh, local traffic is limited to the subnet. Now, what local traffic means is, as I pointed out earlier, we have two flavors of a broadcast message. One is a directed broadcast at a particular subnet, and that would be the network ID, 129, 21, 255, 255, and then we have what we call that limited broadcast, which is all 255s. Uh, all 255s is limited to that particular subnet, uh, and then these are usually married with that broadcast frame address. Uh, for those of you getting a brush up, just as a reminder, um, IP addresses are four bytes in length, and um, MAC addresses are six bytes in length. Okay, now, also as a reminder, MAC addresses belong to the subnet, or even the, if we start off with a class full network, they belong to the class full network, but the minute you subnet, MAC addresses now belong to uh, that subnet and that subnet alone. So there's a, we have a common phrase that says, you will never learn the MAC address of a node on a different network under normal operations. And now we'll say that you will not know or be able to see the MAC address for a node on a different subnet. Uh, a router, or at least a routing function, if you're, if you've got, um, if you're trunking or something like that, a router or a routing function is required to go between the subnets. Okay, and the same is true with a classful network, right? If you're going to get off the classful network, you need a router. All right. So, how do we figure out what we're going to do with all these subnets? Or how do we figure out even how to start the subnetting process? Well, one of the first things you have to do is figure out exactly how many subnets you need. Now, Every organization is a little bit different. You might put different floors on different networks or different VLANs. You might have servers and wireless and VoIP on different VLANs and different subnets. Uh, you might have groups based on department, uh, like the place that I used to work. Now, one of the other important questions here is that not only do you have to figure out how many subnets you need, but how many users are going to be in each subnet. And so that's the addresses required. Now, if you make it really, really tight, if you just say something like, well, um, I've got 16 users in each subnet, and, and, I can, and look at that, I can build subnets exactly to that size. You haven't really accounted for growth. All right, so that's an important aspect of this. You want to leave a little room in your subnets. And then, of course, you've got to take a look at the capabilities of your current equipment. Um, if you're port poor on your routers, well, you've got to buy more equipment. All right. So once you've figured out how many subnets you need and how many users are going to be on each subnet and how much room you need over the next couple of years, and then it's time to actually start manipulating masks. And we do that, again, by stealing those bits out of the host portion. Okay? The number of bits stolen is directly related to the number of subnets that you need. All right? Now, by stealing, all, of them, all that I mean is that we converted the mask, the class full mask, to binary. We saw where the zeros are. And then working from the left side of those zeros, we're going to start changing zeros into ones. And that creates, creates our subnet field, and those are the bits that we actually steal. Now again, don't panic. I'm going to do an example. All right. Now, common subnet patterns as you steal bits um, are shown here on this particular slide. Now, I've got class A, B, and C uh, represented here. And what I'll do right now, because it's a little easier to see, is I'll look at the class Cs. So, um, if I haven't stolen any bits at all, I have that very first row there, 255, 255, 255, 0 in the class C columns. I really have one network or one subnet and 256 possible addresses per that network. All right. If you steal one bit, then you've changed your mask now to 255, 255, 255, 128, and you've split that network into two subnets. And each subnet has the corresponding 
uh, number of hosts, so 128. So that's 256 divided by 2, and so on and so forth. So if you steal two bits, you've created four networks, uh, and each network has 64 possible hosts, and so on and so forth. Now, it doesn't matter what class you start with. You're going to start stealing bits from the left portion of the host section. And so we see these bit patterns uh, repeated just in a different octet. So in that class A network, stealing uh, one bit gives me 255, 128. In class B, it's 255, 255, 128. And we already did the class C. Okay? Now one of the important things that I'll mention there, as you steal the as you steal bits, the number of um, hosts per subnet goes down, but also the amount of overhead that you have in terms of lost addresses also goes up, and we can talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so let's do a pretty straightforward example here. We've got a company and they want four subnets created on this 200.150.100.0 network. Remember that we started off with a class full network of 255, 255, 255.0 with a mask and 256 possible addresses, 254 usable. Now we want four subnets and from our previous slide in order to create four subnets, I need to steal two bits. I'm sorry, I got a phone call coming in on the other line. We'll just let them hang up here. Um, so if we steal uh, two bits, what's going to happen here is that the binary patterns available in two bits are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now these are the values that we'll actually see in that subnet field as we work through our example, so don't let those go. The stolen bits are revealed in the math. Now what that means is that if we steal two bits from the host portion, Instead of 255, 255, 255.0, we get a 192 at the end there. And I got that by uh, the binary pattern 11000000. That gives us 192. All right. Now hold on a second. How, do, how did I do this? Remember that we started off with our class full. We've got the low usable and the high usables. And these, um, the high usable is often for the router. Now that's entirely, I'm just going to mention this now because we'll revisit it later, but um, when we say we've got 256 possible, 254 usable, um, it's actually 253 because you've got to assign one of those to a router. Um, now whether you assign addresses high or low in the range, that's entirely a local convention. And then there's our broadcast, and of course there's our mask. And all of these addresses, when we do that ending, all wind up on the same network, 200.150.100.0. But when we do our subnetting, remember that we stole those two bits, and there they are in the subnet mask, and that's how I got that 192. Now I'm going to use this convention for the rest of the slides here. Uh, wherever you see red, that's what I'm going to call that, that uh, subnet field. Okay. So again, the bits that are affected by this change in the mask are those bits that you can see lower down on this particular slide. So we had our class full network of 100.0, and I steal those two bits out of the host portion. Okay. So what we're going to do is take those same binary patterns and make these changes to this particular subnet field. All right. So everybody, regardless of what subnet they're going to wind up on, uses the same subnet field. So what our subnet ranges turn out to be is 0 to 63, 64 to 127, 128 to 191, and 192 to 255. And that's because we changed this subnet field. Now, uh, don't panic, no, but because I'm going to show you exactly where these numbers come from. But this is your first hint at the first technique that I'll show you uh, how to uh, build your subnets and how to figure out um, your subnet plan. All I did here was I said, well, look, I had 256 possible addresses. I needed four subnets, and I divided 256 by four, and I got my ranges. Zero to 63 is 64 addresses. 64 to 127 is 64, and so on. 
hopefully I'm not going uh, too fast for you guys. Let me know. If, if you need me to slow down at any point, uh, just feel free to let me or Yasmina know. Okay. So again, um, we've got this subnet field here. So what I'm going to do is we'll start off with taking a particular host. And I just grabbed this one at random. So this is 200.150.100.137. So what I'm going to do is convert that to binary the same way that we did with that earlier host, dot .95. But remember, remember now, we have this new uh, subnet mask, dot .192 there at the end. So the binary pattern is right there for you. So we start off with our anding process. I bring my IP address down in binary. I and it with the mask that you see there in binary and the result is shown there on that uh, third line. And we can see that instead of all zeros in that host portion, we now have a one zero. Converting back to base 10, we get 200.150.100.128. And I'll just zip back to this other slide here real quick for a second. And we can see that the host was 137 and fell into that range for uh, 128 to 191. Uh, so we got a question here. Uh, we got a question on uh, does subnetting help with improving performance on the network? And the answer is absolutely maybe. It depends on what your performance problem is. If your performance is a result of lots and lots of network traffic or if you have a particular device that needs an improved um, service or improved performance, and it's in there with a whole bunch of other nodes and everybody's sucking up the bandwidth, uh, then absolutely subnetting um, can improve performance. Now, if you, my students often tell me that um, in the dorms or in their apartments, sometimes you're, they run into, into trouble. They're trying to get something done and somebody's running a server or somebody's uh, watching a lot of videos online and it sucks up all the bandwidth. But if they're on a different network, there's the possibility that they would be isolated from that, that traffic. So absolutely, you can get a performance improvement with subnetting. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, the minute we stole those bits for the subnet field, instead of having eight bits available for our host portion, we now have six. So what I've highlighted here in this slide is the remaining or available host addressing space for this particular subnet. And actually all of the subnets in the, the four that we created have the same size address space. So again, there's my uh, binary for the, the last part of the host portion. Um, now, the other thing that's significant here is that I want you to go back to that Think about that early slide where we said if we've got the network ID and then we put all zeros in the host portion, we get the network ID. And if we take the network ID and then put all ones in the host portion, we get the directed broadcast at that particular network. Well, here we see the exact same thing. Knowing that we can't touch the subnet field anymore, if we put all zeros in the host portion, we get the subnet address. And if we put all ones in the host portion, then what we get is the directed broadcast at that particular subnet. Now, it looks like we got a, another question here. Uh, does subnetting usually help the most with broadcast heavy traffic and how does subnetting work with multicast traffic? Oh, good question. Okay, so we'll take the first part first, uh, or the first question about uh, the broadcast heavy traffic. Uh, no. Uh, it certainly helps with broadcast because the minute you create a subnet boundary, you've automatically limited the amount of broadcast traffic that can exist on that particular subnet. So, for example, if all of your 254 possible nodes were generating about the same amount of broadcast traffic and you were on that network, you would have to listen to or compete with all of that broadcast traffic. So the minute that you subnet, you are now competing with the other 60 or so uh, nodes, in this particular example, the other 60 or so network nodes uh, and their broadcast traffic. So automatically you're competing with less broadcast traffic. But in addition, um, there is the 
all the other traffic that nodes generate on top of that. So again, imagine that, oh, I don't know, let's say that it's a regular work day and everybody's out there looking at YouTube. Now I know that none of you would watch YouTube uh, while you're working, but actually I hear some people do. All right, so they're all watching YouTube. Can you imagine trying to compete with bandwidth with all of that, that video traffic? Because so much stuff is, is um, you know, a streaming base, they're generating a tremendous amount of traffic on your, on your particular network, almost in whatever we do. So you're not only competing with their broadcast traffic, you're also competing with all the other traffic that, that they um, generate. Not because all of it's coming to you, because in a switched architecture it doesn't, but because that single routed interface is now handling all that traffic. So when you subnet, now you've got a routed interface for your particular subnet that's not doing as much work. Okay, so multicast traffic. Multicast is a whole other area, um, but the um, multicast traffic is really interesting. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll just mention this. Multicast frames are forwarded in much the same way the broadcast frames are. So if a node is generating broadcast traffic and the network is not configured to limit that broadcast traffic, then everybody has to listen to broadcast traffic. Uh, the same is true, so that's on the layer two level, but on layer three the same thing occurs if you are going to be generating broadcast traffic and sending it to a particular network or subnet. Broadcast traffic gets sent everywhere. Now the routing for, broadcast, or for multicast traffic is gets a little interesting, you've got to enable it, and then there are ways to limit the amount of multicast traffic, but there you have it. The, the real bugaboo there is that uh, multicast frames are forward in much the same way that um, the broadcast frames are. Now we can do things like IGMP snooping and things like that to help limit that, but without doing anything, you can compete with multicast traffic. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Yep, we got some a follow up here from JD about IGMP snooping, and I think we just we just talked about that. Okay. So uh, this goes back to how I figured out uh, the subnet subnet addresses or the network addresses. So in that initial slide, I just said, well, here's your subnet: zero sixty four one twenty eight one ninety two. And one way of doing that is just simply say, all right, what's uh, 256 divided by 4, and then what are the actual possible ranges, and so on. But the, the way to do it without, um, and, and I think that it helps ensure that you don't make any mistakes, is to take those bits that you stole, those two bits that you stole, figure out where your subnet field is going to be, and then just insert the four possible binary patterns in those two bits. Now, you can see here that I've highlighted in red those four original patterns that you have from stealing two bits. And if you, if you convert those back to base 10, you get 100.0, 100.64, 100.128, and 100.192, okay? And the routers, again, now this is, this is one of the things that actually confuses a lot of students, so I'll just take a moment to, to say, again, each subnet has to have its own routed interface or its own uh, router, default gateway. Now, this means that whatever your local convention here, and the convention that I chose to use was high in the range. So for the zero subnet here, um, the range of addresses is zero to 63, so a high address in that range would be 62. And the same thing would be true on the other four subnets. What's significant here is that the routed interface is on that particular subnet. And so if you did the ANDing with the new subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, 192, you would find out that each one of these addresses would reside on a different subnet. So let's take this one step farther. Okay, so um, if we were to, let me just actually go back for one second. I think I double clicked. I did not. Let me just, uh, I'll just point something out here. That these are, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the subnet addresses. And remember that that six zeros there, all the way to the right on each one of the binary patterns, that's the host portion. And if I took all ones and stuck it in there, I would get the high address for this particular range. 
Okay. So again, that high address would be the directed broadcast at that particular subnet. All right, so now we're going to take a little tougher example. I'm going to work with a Class B network. Okay, this happens to be uh, one of the private addresses typically used with network address translation, but it doesn't really matter. It's a Class B network, and this time we're going to use eight subnets. And also this time what I'm going to do is take you step by step through the two techniques. All right, um, and so we've been hinting at the two techniques, but let's, let's do a step-by-step -step sort of thing uh, to conclude our webcast today. So we get eight subnets out of this Class B. Now, if you remember from the earlier slide, a Class B network is a big network. It has 65,536 possible addresses. Okay, well, how many subnets do I have? Well, if I do a straight algebra example, uh, that means that I just take my class full address space and divide it by eight, and I get 8,192 hosts per network. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be a network that performs very well. This is just our example. So if I want eight subnets, how many bits do I have to steal from the host portion to get eight subnets? And the answer is three. In three bits, I can come up with eight possibilities. Now, remembering that a Class B network starts off with a mask of 255.255.00, this means that if I steal three bits from the host portion in that third octet there, my, NAS, my mask would now be uh, 224.0. So 255.255.224.0. All right. Now, the other thing to remember here is that when you're trying to figure out your subnets, you always start at the class full network address. So, the only really tough question in a problem like this is, wow, it's a dotted quad notation. We've got four bytes of addressing, and we know that one byte is 256 possible values. Well, what the heck does 8,191 look like in dotted quad notation. Not binary, dotted quad notation. Uh, and the reason I picked 8,191 is because remember that our range starts at zero. So we start with zero and go to 8,191 for a total of 8,192 possible addresses. Well, it turns out that if you do convert 8,191, you would get a whole bunch of ones. And you convert that back to uh, base 10 numbers, and our range of addresses, in this case, is 172.30.0.0 to 172.30.31.255. Now, just a little bit of binary math here, and we say, all right, well, what's the next possible value? Well, if you know a little bit about binary, you know that if you add 1 to 255, it turns them all to 0. And then that just keeps going on until we add, finally add 1 to 31 and we actually get 32. So my next subnet is 172.30.32.0. And then we have the corresponding range. Now, if you're looking ahead a little bit and you see that we're just adding 31.255 to whatever the subnet address is, you're absolutely right. So one way to look at this is that I'm just going to add one more to that 63.255 and get my next value, which is 64.0. So now I'm in my third subnet. And I add 31 to that, and I get 95, 95.255 if I want the range, and so on and so forth. So all that I've done here is I took the classful address space, figured out how many subnets I wanted to create, and then um, figured out uh, what that looked like in dotted quad notation, and then I simply added one to get my new subnet, and then added 31.255. Now, if we go back to our earlier example, all that we did there is we had the class full address of 200, 100.0. We divide that by four to get those subnets in our examples there, and we get uh, 64 possible addresses. So, zero to 63, we add one, 64. We add uh, 63 to that, 64 plus 63 is 127, so the next range was 64 to 127, and so on. Okay. So, 
Uh, hopefully you're, you're following along okay and I haven't lost anybody. Um, so here's method two, and this is going right back to the binary. So all that I did here was I said, look, I don't want to make any mistakes with this addition. It's too easy to make mistakes trying to figure out the shortcut. So what I'm going to do now is that I said I stole three bits from the host portion, and there they are. And I know that in my three bits that I stole, I have eight possibilities. And you can see going down through this column that I've got all of those possibilities represented, starting from 000 to 001, 010, and on down to 111. And then all that happens now is that I fill in all zeros for the host portion, and presto, there I have my subnet addresses. And if you go back, if you actually convert these back uh, to base 10 numbers, you'll see that you have the exact same values that we had on the previous slide. Okay. So the next step in the process is now to take these exact same uh, numbers and take the host portion, and again, instead of putting zeros there to get my subnet addresses, what I'm going to do is put all ones there to get the directed broadcast for that particular subnet, or what we call the upper end of the range. Okay, just checking for questions real quick here. All right. Okay. Uh, and again, the routers would typically be high or low in the range. So if we look at this first network address range of 172.30.00 to 172.30.31.255, you might pick 31.254 for a router address. All right. Now, I see that we're coming to the end here. Uh, I wanted to, to mention something uh, quickly here, uh, one of, if you read Cisco, Cisco documentation on subnetting, sometimes you'll come across the phrase that says you can't use the lowest possible subnet here. So I'm just going to go back to uh, these slides here where my network addresses are. And Cisco might say, well, wait a minute, you can't use that 172.30.00 network um, and you also can't use, oh, I say I have a, a, I have a typo there. Anyway, can't use the last subnet either um, for, yeah, I got a typo on the last line there, uh, 172.30, 255 it should be. I uh, can't use that last one, 172.30, 255, 255 either. The reason that, they, that sometimes you'll hear that you can't use the lowest subnet is because it's the same address as the classful uh, network and that can uh, be confusing to network administrators and routers alike. And you're not supposed to use the top subnet because that directed broadcast for that subnet is the same address as the directed broadcast for the class full network. But if you talk to anybody out in industry, they don't want to give out or get rid of these two subnets. And the reason for uh, that is that if I were to get rid of two of my eight subnets, I've lost 25% of my address space. And so um, IP subnet zero is one of the commands that you can make sure that uh, you uh, use to make sure that you can recover some of this address space. So if anybody ever tells you that you can't use the lowest possible subnet or the highest possible subnet, um, just remember that they're probably getting, you know, the strict um, traditional way of doing it, but um, we absolutely use the lowest uh, subnet and the highest. Okay. I see we're getting a little long on time here, so I'll just uh, polish off with our last slide here. The, um, the chapter that we're going through now also goes on to uh, talk about supernetting, classless interdomain routing, uh, a little bit on variable link subnet masks and aggregation. Now these are ideas that are related to manipulation of the mask. The ideas are exactly the same. You steal bits in the other direction if you're going to do aggregation or supernetting or CIDR, uh, but the ideas are exactly the same. But what we really wanted to do today was to give you two solid methods for handling subnetting. Um, and, and I think that's gonna, we're going to conclude right there, but there all of these methods are just different ways to manipulate the, uh, the address space via the mask. Well, thanks very much for hanging out with me today. Um, 
if you have questions, you can go ahead and email me. I don't mind at all. Uh, and, uh, of course, keep an eye out for podcasts. I just really got started on those, so i got a couple out there, but I haven't gotten to this chapter yet. So you can feel free to forward questions. And with that, I'll take any questions you have. Great. Thank you very, very much, Bruce. Folks, you've heard Bruce. If you do have a question for him and what he's been explaining to you and showing to you uh, today on this webcast, please type it into the group chat and send it in so he can answer it while he's still with us. Um, I can tell you that one question came in really early in the event, and Bruce, if you can click on that Q&A tab, because this one's going to be hard for me to read because I'm not um, as technical as you in your audience. Um, can you see that at all? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, what am I looking for here? Let's see. Okay. I see the link to the podcast website. It'll be on the on the on our presenter console that you and I see. Oh. oh, oh. Right under that, that tab. Then there's that Q and A tab. I'm in the wrong spot here. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um. Hey, what? Okay, uh, don't we have reserve for broadcasting? This, so uh, this question was, uh, don't we have, you know, wildcards.255 reserve for broadcasting? And that's absolutely true, especially in, true for class full networking. So in our example here, uh, we talked about how 200, 150, 100.255 was the directed broadcast at that particular network. But the important thing to remember here, and I'll just actually go back in the slides real quick. Um, let's see here. Go back a little faster. I'm going to go back to that earlier example. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk as I'm doing it. The important thing to remember is that the minute you subnet, your broadcast addresses are no longer 255s. So let's say I lost it. Where are you? Uh, getting there, getting there. Because the 255 exists in only one subnet. So the broadcast addresses are actually now in... Is this it? Um, yeah, this will work. Okay, so uh, let me push this one out here to you guys. So here are the 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 subnets that we had in this particular example, 0, 64, 128, and 192. Those are the actual subnet addresses. Now, the broadcast address at the dot zero subnet is actually dot 63. So if you were looking for 255s and you're subnetting, the only one that will have 255 as a broadcast address will be that last subnet, dot 192. Dot 128 will actually have a broadcast address of dot 191. And dot 64 will have a broadcast address of dot 127. And that's really, really critical. And why I was pointing out that once you have the subnet field created, you're down to six uh, bits of addressing for the host, and all zeros will be the net subnet ID, and all ones in the host portion will be the directed broadcast at that particular subnet. So good question, good question. Great. Looks like we have a couple more that just came in through the group chat. We've got, let's see here, um, Nicholas says, what about VPN? Can you give some base on it? Uh, let's see. Let me read here. Nicholas, where are you? Oh, same thing here. We have next question. All right. So let me plug in. Try and find this question here. Uh, oh, what about VPN? Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Uh, a VPN is a virtual private network, and the common application is to connect remote users uh, to a site. So let's say that you're at your house and you want to connect to work, so you VPN into work. Now, the magic there is that you have a particular IP address and range and network for your home network, but the minute you VPN into your work, you're actually given an IP address on that particular network. Now, the way that it works is that when you VPN in somewhere, you have a routing table change on the host that's VPNing in. So you're on your laptop, you VPN in, 
there's a change to the host routing table to send traffic to the destination network over what we call the tunnel that you've established. So VPNs and subnetting aren't necessarily related, although certainly um, the, the concepts can be applied to VPNs. Not sure if that answers your question, but let's see. Um, any other questions here? Can we use subnetting to plug in devices that have the same MAC address? For example, some embedded devices onto the same network. Okay, um, well, devices that have the same MAC address create all kinds of problems when they're trying to talk to each other. Uh, the, the, the real issue is that when a host is trying to build an Ethernet frame or an 802.11 frame to the destination, we use the MAC address. Uh, and if, uh, if there's more than one node out there with the same MAC address, then the, only one of the destinations will typically get the frame. So maybe a better way to handle that is with a multicast frame or something of that sort. Now, if those hosts with the same MAC address are on different networks, then it won't matter because um, the, um, the MAC addresses won't be seen by um, by the nodes. So someone can have your same MAC address um, but be on a different network and you can conceivably work through that because they will never see um, your MAC address and you'll never see theirs. When you want to talk to them, you'll communicate uh, with the router in terms of MAC address. And I hope that, hope that answers your question. Uh, FYI, this is all referencing IP version 4 for broadcasting. Uh, IP version 6 no longer uses broadcasting. That's true. There's a, a whole different world when we get to IP version 6. Unfortunately, IP version 6 hasn't been adopted anywhere near as fast as folks had hoped, and so we still continue to, uh, to need and understand um, subnetting and IP, IP version 4 uh, networking. Uh, let's see, do we have any other questions out there? I'm not seeing any additional questions come in. Uh, let's see. Nope, I'm not seeing any. Did you have anything further for our audience today, Bruce? I don't think so, other than to say feel free to forward questions to me. You can email me, of course, um, and take a look for updates. But I'd be happy to, happy to answer any questions you send via email.